Hello, this is Brother Jerry, the pastor here at Friendship Baptist Church, and you are about to watch one of our messages. I hope that during this time that you would prayerfully listen. I hope that the Lord speaks to you, that he uses this message to help you grow. I hope you're able to experience God. I hope you're able to connect with him and connect with our church. I hope that you're able to respond to what he's doing in your life. I hope you enjoy. May the Lord bless you during this time. All right, this is our welcome song. Y'all tell everybody hello. Step into the water, way down a little bit deeper. When your feet in the water of his love. Oh, step into the water, children. Way down a little bit deeper. Little bit deeper. Come join angels singing praises to the Lamb of God. It's time we the people stand up for what is right. It's time we squared our shoulders back and raise our swords to fight. For the Bible is our weapon and the Spirit is my shield. The church needs more of its members to be workers in the field. Thank you, sir. I tell you what, God's good this morning, isn't he? Oh, uh, we're missing a good, about half of our people because half of them are in San Antonio uh, worshiping down there. But you know what? That's pretty exciting, isn't it? Um, that we got a good group of ladies all down there um, worshiping the Lord together. And they'll be, I think, here uh, what about 6 o'clock tonight or so. Is that about right? I don't know. With the way your wife drives that bus van, I don't know. Um, but uh, we'll... Uh, see them tonight so we're looking forward to seeing them again and just pray for them that i've heard from a lot of them about how god has just really spoke this weekend and um i'm just overwhelmed uh, them with uh, just god's faithfulness and so praise god for that uh i'm just thankful to to know that i got a couple of announcements here this morning first off uh reach texas offering is this is the last sunday um in the month that we collect that and so i mean of course you can give to any time but we have a goal for september set for a thousand dollars and we are at $975.50, so we're $24.50 short of our goal. Come on, y'all, we can do this. I believe we can. Um, and then we have women's Bible study. Even though uh, uh, some of the women are not uh, going to be here, they're still having that Bible study tonight at 530. And I think um, Susan or one, someone else might be teaching it because... Um, just so y'all know, uh, um, Skip's in the hospital in, in Tyler uh, this morning. He went last night and had a bladder infection, and, and he's had those struggles with that. But uh, it really scared him this time. Uh, so that's, we're going to pray for him. Jack and Alva Joe's in the hospital. Um, we just had a, a several things that happened this week I want y'all to notice so we can be praying for one another. Jack turned 95 on Friday, 95. And unfortunately, uh, he had to spend that in the hospital. But uh, 
Um, he's doing a, okay. He's in a back brace and, and he's talking coherent. And then um, Miss Alva Joe's is going to be going to Legacy probably tomorrow. And so please be in prayer for them. In fact, let's just go ahead and lift them up. God, Lord, we um, just lift up our family, Lord. That's who they are. They're family to us. They're our brothers and sisters, Lord. And in fact, uh, Jack's uh, even a spiritual father to many of us, Lord, uh, the same way that Paul was to Timothy, Lord. And I just praise you for uh, um, your love for, for them, Lord, and, and for Skip as well, God. I, I just ask that um, your hand would overwhelm uh, uh, all three of them this morning, Lord, and their families, and that you would uh, uh, touch them with your healing, Lord, give them a, a strength and, and uh, a presence of, of yourself, Lord, that, that brings about this awesome peace, Lord. Lord, I just uh, I seek you as we carry one another's burdens. We'll talk about that later today, Lord. As we do that, let us genuinely, sincerely do that, Lord. God, we um, lift up uh, uh, the Bird family to you as well. Miss uh, Beverly Shepler's uh, mom's visitations today after church. I lift uh, that family to you, Lord, as, as uh, they're grieving and going through uh, that process, Lord. Lord, help us be the church. Help us wrap arms around one another, love one another, send messages, um, notes, Lord. Help us uh, uh, be there present, Lord. Help us just love one another. In the name of Christ, I pray. Amen. We have uh, Friendship 101 finished its class today, and so that was exciting. So we'll have, um, uh, I know, at least two new members next week, and so that's uh, looking forward to that, bringing them before y'all. We have October 4th is Family Ministry Launch, and I want to just give you a, another note here with that. If you are a widow, or a, um, if you're singled, or if you're married, or if you don't have kids, or you do have kids, I want you here <laughs> next week, okay? Um, because I believe it's important that every one of us, because we together are a faith family, Amen. And so it's important that if, as we uh, work uh, at seeking the Lord and, and yield to His Spirit as we minister to families, um, it's important to understand that we are one family. And so uh, please be here next week. Um, me and Jacqueline's really excited about walking through that with you. It'll look a little different, but it'll be exciting. And uh, I already saw a couple of you um, scoping out the, the Faith at Home wall. It may not make sense right now, but it will next week. And so looking forward to sharing a little bit about that. Sunday school resumes next week. That means all kids ministry resumes next week as well on Sunday morning. So um, we'll see y'all in Sunday school classes, Lord willing. If you're still not comfortable doing that, we understand. We're just making the option available for those that are. And then uh, I believe that's it as far as our announcements go. Y'all ready to continue to worship the Lord? Yes. Amen. Let's do that very thing. Our uh, birthday and anniversary song. It's a little long, so if y'all would just stand with us. You can wait till the end and come up. But y'all can sing along with us. Yes.
Well, do we have any birthday and anniversaries besides one I know of? Well, we're going to sing happy birthday to you anyway, but we're going to do it a cappella. Everybody ready? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Amen. All right. Well, I think this is one where you're trying to do the girls' part, ain't you? Well, y'all bear wait, with wait, us. Wait, 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 <laughs> wait. No. Hold, hold it. Look over your shoulder for a minute. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we'll go with that. Lisa, again. Lisa, turn that mic way down. Oh, you? I got him. He's good. Come on, brother. I'm going to worship the Lord. I don't know what y'all are Amen, Amen brother. Amen. <laughs> Are you washing the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washing the blood of the Lamb? Are you washing the blood of the Lamb? In the soul with the blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white and so? Are you washing the blood of the about you guys, but I hear a whole lot more singing without them ladies over there. <laughs> I, the crowd just getting into it today. That really helps us out because we're kind of worried about how it's going to turn out. But, all right. Isolation. 
Praise the Lord, church. Oh, uh, rejoicing and worshiping the Lord can be fun, can it? Can it? Yeah. Amen. Praise the Lord. I believe it can be. I have fun worshiping the Lord all the time. Oh, uh, he's worthy of the worship anyways, isn't he? Father God, Lord, we uh, just humble ourselves before you, Lord, and as we... Uh, Open up your word this morning as we get into Galatians and finishing Galatians up. God, I just ask that, Lord, um, as our hearts are bowed before you, Lord, and our, our minds are bowed before you, God, Lord, that you would just bring about your grace in such a special way to give us understanding of your scripture, Lord. Lord, I pray that as we look at um, what you're saying to us, Lord, that it would move us, it would change us, transform us, Lord. Help us to see uh, what it means to live in the Spirit, to walk in the Spirit, Lord. Lord, we pray for the Spirit of God to be in this place. Lord, if we're going to be able to walk to it, let us recognize first who you are, Lord. The magnificent God that you are in your Spirit, Lord, that indwells us as children of yours. God, I just pray that you show us through your word this morning what that means to walk in that, Lord. In the name of Christ, I pray. Amen. So today we get to finish up the Galatian letter, and uh, I got to catch my breath a little bit after singing. I'm not used to doing that, but praise the Lord. I'm enjoying uh, myself in the Lord's house this morning and and just, again, just asking that he would be exalted and worshipped. As we look at this letter and we finish this up, it's really um, um, exciting, I think, uh, kind of wrapping this up and seeing what God's been speaking to us through this whole time. In fact, if you remember the very first week that we talked about Galatians in this letter, I asked you all to go home and I said, read the letter to the Galatian church, read it in one sitting, just all the way through, whether it was that night or that week sometime. And I asked you all to do that. And I had several of you all come back that Sunday night and even later on that week and said, I read it. I was like, praise the Lord. And What'd you think? Uh, It's kind of (laughs) hard. It's kind of tough. And I know it is. That's why I asked you all to do that, because Galatians is is kind of a tough letter. As we read that, it can be hard if we're not careful. It can be very hard and we can get some misunderstanding as we go through this letter. And so it's important to take our time and seek the Lord and his spirit as he helps us discern what this letter is saying. And so I've asked you all to do that. Now my prayer is and my ask for you all is to go home now this week and go back and read through it again. As you go through, read all the way through all six chapters in one sitting. Just sit down. It shouldn't take you too long and and just read through it and i pray that this time after having gone through and broken it down and 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 looking at the context and what's really happening in this letter i pray that god really just shows himself so much in this letter to you and that you would get this clear sense of understanding i think we spend too much time reading the bible and not understanding it i really do i think if we're honest so many of us can spend so much time reading the scriptures because we know we're supposed to do it and we just kind of leave it with saying well i read it That's about it. I don't really know what it says. I'm not okay with that. I don't want to stop there. I don't want to be uh, abandoned in that place because that is a a sorrowful place. Just to be honest, and I'm there, I'm I'm not coming down on you. I'm saying, I don't want to be there anymore. I want to get in his word and I want the spirit to show himself so much that it makes sense and he shows himself and I'm excited and exalting him in it. That's my prayer as we get into the word of God. And so, May you go back and you hear Paul's heart and his plea to you, to not only the Galatian church, but his heart and his plea to you, his plea to heed to this one true gospel message, this plea to see that this is the same gospel that's been proclaimed since the beginning of time, to heed to this fact that we are to be freed in this message and not bound by sin or not bound even by law, that we are free in Christ. Praise the Lord, church. That's the message that we get. And he pleased to say, now walk in that freedom. We talked about that last week. And now he says, walk in the spirit. Walk in the spirit. That is my prayer is that we would catch what Paul is saying here. He kind of walks through this natural progression. He kind of goes through and he says, you remember I was there with you. You remember it. I saw you changed. I saw you transformed. That God's grace was showered upon you. And now I'm watching as You're going back into this bondage and the slavery. That's the progression that he's been walking through. He says, but don't be a slave to sin, to our power, our strength, our will, our desires. Don't be enslaved to that. Be enslaved if you're going to be enslaved to Christ and to love. So that's what he's getting at 
and he summed it up kind of last week as we looked at chapter 5. If you're there in chapter 5, say amen. amen. Look at verse 5 with me. I don't have this on the screens. I just want to start there. This is a recap of what we talked about last week. It says, For we, through the Spirit, eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything, but faith working through love. And so we broke that down last week. We looked at how it's by faith, through the Spirit, and it's in hope and with love, and how how we're to walk in that freedom, yes. But then this week, what Paul's going to do, and I hope this helps us understand this passage this morning, is he says, okay, I've given you this kind of outline. Now let me zoom in on this word Spirit for a moment. When I say through the Spirit, what does that mean? What does it mean to be in the Spirit, to walk through the Spirit and with the Spirit? What does that look like? And that's really when he comes to this verse 16. So if you're at chapter 5, verse 16, say amen. I say then, walk in the Spirit. I say then, walk in the Spirit. He says, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. But listen to that. Walk in the Spirit. We have this imperative, this command. All this time through the letter of Galatians, it's not really been these commands. It's been, don't you understand? Why don't you understand? It's this doctrine, this theology, this, this, this treatment of, of who God is and the gospel message. And now at the end of his letter, as he's closing it up, he says, I'm giving you a charge now. Now that you understand. You see, because when we open God's word, the Spirit gives us understanding. Now that you understand, would you walk in the Spirit? What does that mean? How do you walk in the Spirit? That's kind of a weird thing to even say, isn't it? Walk in the Spirit? Well, that's what Paul is going to show us as we close up this last part of this letter, what it means to walk in the Spirit. But to understand that this word walk really has more of a, more connotations than just walking like I'm doing right now. It's it's more about the idea of how you conduct your life or how your life is being conducted maybe is even a better way of saying it. How are you living? And so when we use the word walk, when he says walk in the spirit, another translation that's adequate would be live in the spirit. And some of your translations might even say live in the spirit. It's the same idea here. Walk in the spirit, live in the spirit. And it comes back to the idea in the Old Testament when people walked with God. It was this idea of them living with God in the presence of God in the dependence of God. That's the idea here to live fully dependent on the spirit. Isn't that where you all want to be? I want to be there, dependent on the Spirit of God. So how does that happen? We get four, three really different expressions that Paul's going to give us here. And the first expression, the first point this morning, is we walk or we live as a warrior in the Spirit. As a warrior. What does that look like? As a warrior. Chapter 5, verse 16. I'm going to ask you again. If you're there, say amen. amen. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh, for the flesh lusts against the Spirit. And the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, he says. So that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Which are, listen to this list he gives. Adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, anger, Selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. So if you didn't get in any of those, he says, and the like, anything else. <laughs> of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. If that don't open your eyes up, I don't know what will this morning. Because if you're like me and you read that You might say, oh, some of that's hitting a little close to home. I may not be a murderer, but even envy and and selfish ambition. I thought it was good to be ambitious about yourself. Uh, Paul says it leads to this place that will not inherit the kingdom of God. So what does that mean? But then in verse 22, we see this contrast. Oh, praise God for this contrast. Verse 22, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law, and those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and, and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. 
Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Church, if we're going to walk in the Spirit, we must walk as a warrior in the Spirit. As we first read this passage here, the first thing that you probably will notice is, is this isn't some leisurely walk. This isn't a walk of leisure. This isn't a life of leisure. This isn't just kind of a, a happenstance of just kind of walking through life. That's not what he's talking about here. When he says walk in the Spirit, it's a walk of war. It's a warrior's walk, a warrior's life. In fact, after reading this, I want, y'all, I want to invite y'all, literally, I want you to invite y'all to, to, to take out the, the war paint. You know what I'm talking about? The war paint. Take it out. Take it from, from, from your purse. Take it from your back pocket and literally take that and, and put it on your face because we're in war. That's what I want you to understand here is as this says walk in the Spirit. We're in war. The, it's a hard, harsh war. Put your face paint on, your war paint, and enter into this war with me. For to be a war, there has to be opponents. So what's, who's the opponents? Well, we have the Spirit versus whom? The flesh. Think about that. The Spirit. That's God. That's part of the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the, the Holy Spirit. That's Him. That's who He is. He's, it's, 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 it's the nature, the essence of God. And so He is in war and battle against flesh. What is flesh? Well, flesh is not just our physical bodies here. That's not what it's talking about here in this passage. It does in other passages, but that's not it here. What's the flesh? The flesh is our sinful nature. It's the nature of self, the sinful nature. And and so when we see this picture, it's a war of God against self, us. Now that don't sound too pleasing, does it? But that's what's happening. That is what we come to as we hear these words, walk in the spirit. We need to be aware of this. It's the worst kind of war. It's an inward war. It's a home front war. It's a war at the home front. It's like a civil war in a sense. It's horrible. And it says in verse 17 that the flesh and the spirit are contrary to one another. Now your mind might take you to this place. And I want to I walk through this with you. Your mind might take you to this place that you saw kind of in cartoons or growing up. And you kind of had this thought that you remember the devil on one side and, and the angel on one side. And the devil's always telling you stuff. And it seems like the more you start listening, the more you get closer to that side. And then... All of a sudden, the angel starts speaking up and says, you know better, you know better. And then you start walking a little closer to this side. And it's just this war back and forth and you're kind of in the middle. I think that's where our mind goes. But I don't think that's the accurate picture here that Paul presents us. That the gospel presents us. You see, the truth is, is I don't think there's a neutral ground. In the sense, if we got the devil over here and the angel over here, or the Holy Spirit, whoever you want to put over here, It puts us in this neutral place, like a default, and we have to make this decision of good versus bad. And and that's the way we're even brought up and we teach our kids at times, but that's not the picture of the gospel. The gospel is is that that there is no default of of neutral. The default, if there is one, is of of flesh, of sinful nature. We are sinful nature. So I want us to understand this picture. I want to paint this picture a little bit different. We are flesh. Does that make sense this morning, church? That literally me and you are the sinful nature. We are flesh. It's not that we're in the middle and we listen to one or the other. We are flesh. It's total anarchy. We rebel against any kind of authority against us. It's self, 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 self. That's what it means when we say the word flesh. However, by God's grace and through faith, what we've been preaching is the Spirit enters in. So while we were self flesh sinful nature the spirit of god enters in now i want you to catch what happens after that because sometimes i think we got a different understanding of this too sometimes i think we talk about people and and, and whenever they want to come to christ and they want to follow christ we kind of walk through a prayer with them and we we tell them to accept jesus into their heart and then we kind of ask them this question at the end we're like um how do you feel it's almost as if it's this mystical thing and we and they're supposed to say well i feel good or i feel relieved or i feel special and I'm not saying that, that that stuff can't happen, but I think that's where our mind goes is if, if this is what salvation is. But again, I want to challenge us this morning. I think of it a little different. I think something else happens as we look at salvation. I think salvation looks more like this. If you're listening, say I'm listening. I think salvation looks a little bit more like the spirit coming in. 
By God's grace, through faith, yes. But when the Spirit comes in, it takes that flesh, that sinful nature, and it body slams that flesh. And it takes it and drags it and throws it up on the cross. You see, I think that's more of the picture of salvation. It takes that flesh of who we are, self-righteous, self-sufficient, all of that. It takes that not bound by time. You see, because the Spirit of God is not bound by time. He takes and throws that sinful nature and crucifies us with Christ so that we can be identified with Christ. Praise the Lord. That's a better picture, I think, of salvation is, is it's a war. It's this battle of the Spirit coming in. And now we know that the Spirit's victorious. Amen? I mean, how could we ever stand a, a chance against God? He's victorious. But it's a war in which He comes in through the Spirit and takes and throws us, our sinful flesh, and crucifies us. Just like Romans 7, 3 says, says that He came in the likeness of sinful nature so that He can condemn sin in our flesh you you remember that part where he goes through this whole thing in fact romans is a very much a commentary to galatians they go hand in hand he says that he came in the likeness of sinful flesh not that he was sin but he became sin our sin and so the spirit enters in and it throws that nature that sinful flesh onto the cross with christ praise the lord and it's in that place that we breathe our last breath and we are completely dependent on the spirit of god Completely dependent on the Spirit of God. It's that place, church, that literally we start to hear those dead, dry bones start to rattle. Clayton introduced me to a song called Rattle. And that's what it's about, those Ezekiel, where it talks about dry bones. God puts spirit into those bones and they start rattling. That's what happens in salvation is we literally are crucified with Christ. But then, as we're dependent on the Spirit, He resurrects us in a spiritual sense with Christ. We're identified with His death, His burial, and His resurrection. That's what baptism's all about. As we go under and come up, we understand this, don't we, church? This is a beautiful picture. But the greatest event of all of that is when he, the Spirit comes in. He comes in and He takes that stone of flesh and He crumbles it before you. The st- I mean, the heart of stone, He crumbles it and puts that heart in which the Spirit of God reigns in. Oh, praise God. So let me make sure this is clear that when we say flesh, we're not talking about the physical body. It's not that the physical body is bad and we need the Spirit. That's not the sense that He's getting at here. That's not the flesh He's talking about. The flesh is crucified in is our sinful nature the flesh of our physical bodies awaits to be glorified the flesh of our physical bodies waits to be glorified just like christ was resurrected our physical bodies await that and what a blessing that is but our hearts have already been unified through the spirit praise god but that's the war you see he's given us a new heart And that's already happened, yes. But then there's this not yet in which our physical body does wait. And we struggle. There's a struggle, a war between flesh and and spirit at times. And he says, please, listen, walk in the spirit. This is the war that's going on. That's what he gets at in chapter 2, verse 20. You remember when he said, I have been crucified with Christ. That's what Paul said earlier in this letter. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the, the life which I now live is in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What is Paul saying? He's saying, I have been crucified and the life I live now that is in the flesh is really lived in Christ, is lived in the Spirit. That's what he's calling us to, church. He's calling us. And Paul says, if this He says, just in case you don't understand, let me give you the results of these two. If we're going to look at flesh versus spirit, let's look at these results here. And so we see this in chapter 5, verse 19. We see the results of the flesh come in. I'm going to go through them one more time. The works of the flesh are evident, in verse 19 it says, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, Contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in the past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. What does he say here? He says, notice, notice what he calls these results of the flesh. He calls them works of the flesh. Now the works of the flesh. This is on purpose here. Works. What does that mean? That's, that's what our sinful nature produces. That flesh. That's what our flesh produces is these works. And that we don't have to think too hard about this. I mean, think about this. Apart from Christ, we know our own heart. 
Doesn't it look very much like this? He says, this is the works of the flesh. Apart from Christ, this is what we look like. But then look, he says, look at the results of the Spirit now. Chapter 5, verse 22. He says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law, he says. Notice Paul calls these results from the Spirit. What's he call them? Fruit of the Spirit. Fruit of the Spirit. Now this is intentional again. Why is he called one works and one fruit? Well, works is what I can do. Apart from Christ, it's about me. What is fruit? Fruit is what God does in us. It's what God, through the Spirit, produces. This is encouraging to know that that the fruit of the Spirit is something that God does in us. Amen? You see, this takes us back to John 15. The Gospel of John, it says in chapter 15, verse 3, it says, or I think it's verse 4, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. Jesus says, and there in John he says, this fruit, this fruit of the Spirit even, it's about me being the vine and you being the branches. And you are connected to me And that fruit is produced then through me and by me. It's kind of like if you think about a branch connected to a vine, there's like the sap that flows through, right? At least that's the way I think about it. There's a sap that flows through and it kind of gives life, gives nutrients, gives gives, uh, uh, whatever it needs to survive. And then if whatever kind of plant or tree it is, it gives the nutrients that causes the blooms, right? I think of that with the with Christ says, I am the vine and you are the branches. The Holy Spirit is like that, that sap that runs through the, the vine and enters into these branches and gives us the nutrients we need, gives us Him to make us look more like Him as we start to bloom. And it's not that we're just more loving or not that we're just more joyful or not that we're just more patient. It's that we're more like Jesus. That's the message here that he's getting at. Paul's not saying, here are some things that you don't do. Because this leads to death and, 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 and hell and, and not getting you into the kingdom of God. That's not what he's saying here. He's not saying these are things you don't do and these are things that you do do. That's not what Paul's getting at. That would go against everything he's been talking about in this whole letter. It's not about the you do these things and you don't do these things. What he's saying is, don't you remember? This is who you were. He says lewdness and idolatry and sorcery and, and, and wrath and anger and, and, and contention. He says that's who you were. Apart from Christ, that's who you were. He says now that you're in Christ, this is who you are now. The love, the joy, the peace, the, all these beautiful things that we see. Now, I, I just think that when you look at this, it's so important to see that the fruit is something that makes us look more like Christ. You see, he continues in verse 24. He says, And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, or envying one another. Something that I always try to point out as we read these passages, especially in the fruit of the Spirit, is, is notice that it's called fruit of the Spirit and not fruits of the Spirit. It's, that's really important. And you say, well, why is that so important? Well, it's not fruits as if it's a plural thing in which he's, he's implementing all these different things in us. It's the fruit. It's the same idea. It's Christ in us. And so I want to walk through that just a, a minute with you to, to, to show you. But because I, I think we have a misunderstanding at times. Because I think we often think, well, I, I'm OK. I'm pretty good at, at love. And I'm, I'm you know, I'm I'm. I'm pretty good with love and I'm pretty good with peace and pretty good with kindness. I do pretty good in those areas, but I really struggle with joy and struggle with patience. And so we start thinking that way. But again, I, I want to say that I think this is the wrong understanding. Listen to the language that we're using. I am really good at these and I am not so good at these. Who's that focused on? It comes back to us. The point of this is, is it's not us. It's, that's the old self that we are this new creation. 
And we are to live in Christ and the Spirit, this fruit of the Spirit is Christ in us and what He is going to bring about in us. I, I, I want to make sure that's very clear here. Because it's only Christ that brings any of these. In fact, I don't believe our response should be, Oh Lord, you know how I, I'm, I'm struggling with joy and I, I need you to give me more joy in my life. How many of us have prayed that prayer? I have plenty of times. Or, oh, Lord, you know, we don't like this one, but we pray it. Oh, Lord, I, I, you know I struggle with patience. Would you give me more patience? And we always make the joke about how that day is just a ruined day afterwards. But I want to challenge us again. This is a message of challenges this morning and thinking of the way we understand things. Let the Spirit give you discernment this morning because I think maybe the response might look more scriptural, or more biblical, or more Christ-centered, or more Christ-exalting if we turn it and say, God... Instead, say, 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 Lord, live in me in such a way that I have your patience. Live in me in such a way that your joy is shown in these circumstances in my life. It's still personal. It's still practical. But it's more about Christ than it is yourself. If we could get that small principle figured out, church, oh, God would radically do something in our community, our nations. It, 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 I mean, that's the principle of the gospel. It's not us. It's him. God, may I abide in you and you and me more and more. Let that be our prayer. God, let me be more in you and you and me. More and more and more and more and more and more. <laughs> Amen? Amen? This makes sense because Christ is the epitome or, or maybe the perfection of the fruit of the Spirit. And why is that? Well, it's because Christ is one with the Spirit. Remember the Trinity we just talked about it? Christ is one with the Spirit. He's one with the Father. It's one essence. God is God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So it makes sense that Christ is the epitome or the perfection of the fruit of the Spirit because He is the Spirit in that sense. The essence of the Spirit is in Him. He's one with it. However, the thing that fascinates me is He calls us to be one with Him. Listen to John 17. You know, John 17 is that prayer that Jesus prays, and we go back to this because it's so important. It's Jesus' prayer before he goes to the cross. He, he says, Lord, help the disciples live in me. That's pretty much what he's getting at. Be united with one another, but also united with us. He says it in verse 21. He says, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you. He says that they may be one, but then listen to this, that they also may be one in us. <laughs> That's mind-boggling to me, that they may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. Jesus is praying, God, the same unity that I share with you and the Holy Spirit, help the disciples, those that are in Christ, share with us. Now, if you thought the Trinity was hard to explain, try to explain someone that God literally makes us one with Him as sinful, and, and He made a way to, to defeat that sin to make us one with Him. That's the glorious good news, y'all. So, we come back to this idea that he is the epitome. And this makes sense because Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Colossians tells us that, right? The image of the invisible God. And so it makes sense that love is something he perfected as he came and he loved us while we were still sinners and even died a death on the cross for us. Joy, he counted it all joy to suffer for the sake of God's purposes. You look at peace, he's the perfect peacemaker between God and man through the crucifixion. We look at patience. Can you imagine the patience of Christ for a second? Literally from being uh, with God since eternity, looking to a point that happens that literally changes our time scale that we literally say BC <laughs> before Christ and then after Christ or, or the, the Latin. I don't really understand um, uh, the AD. Um, I always say after death. You all realize it don't mean after death. <laughs> it's like a day of the Lord. I don't know. Anyways patience he waits till that time after being with god for eternity and then he comes in flesh and for 33 years walks patiently and bears the cross patiently and then still today and as wicked as we are at times patiently draws and pursues us kindness goodness gentleness look at the gospels faithfulness oh to the point of he was sweating blood. He's faithful. To the point of he had self-control to say, not my desires, not my will, your will, Lord. So church, join me in walking, living as a warrior in the Spirit. But that war, that fight is this. Abide in me, Lord, and I in you more and more. That's the fight that we fight. 
Then he continues in chapter 6. We're going to see how he gives us another way to walk in the Spirit. I'm going to read the Scripture first and I'll give you the point. It says in chapter 6, if you're there, say amen. It says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, not necessarily holier than thou or, 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 or right with God, it's you that are in the Spirit is what he's saying. Restore such a brother in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so full fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one examine his own work, and then he will rejoice in himself alone and not in another. For each one shall bear his own load. Let him who is taught the word share in good things with him who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who uh, sows to the, his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. The point here that I believe we're getting at is we walk or we live in the spirit as a family, as a family in the household of faith. That's what he's getting at. He starts off there. And as you first read this passage, you might sound confused. You might think, oh, man, this is confusing. I'm telling you, it took me a long time to decipher and walk through this and ask the Lord for his understanding in him and and still a a struggle at times. And so as you read this, it's confusing. He says, bear one another's burdens. And he says, carry your own load. (laughs) Paul, what do you mean? (laughs) What does that look like? And so uh, you can get kind of confused in this, but I think the principle, the, the simple thing that we must understand here, first off, is that he's calling us to walk in the spirit as a family. Listen to the first word. He says, brethren, brothers. Brothers and sisters, brethren, those that are in Christ. And then at the end, he finishes up and says, uh, that as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith, he says. And so while it can be confusing, I think the first thing we must understand is this idea of family. If we're going to walk in the spirit, we're to do it as a family. This is one of the reasons I'm so excited about next Sunday, y'all, with family ministry launch, because we are called to be a family in Christ. In fact, Don was telling me a little bit about his church he went to, and they had the brotherhood. And I love that language. It's, it's a family. It's a family. We are called to be a family together, a household of faith, not just any family, but one of faith, a faith family. And again, whoever you are, come, because it's important. That's the biblical language it uses for the church, that we are a family. And Paul gives some ways this happens, how we're to be a family. And I'll just walk through them quickly here. Verse 1 shows that we're to yield to the Spirit and restorative work with a brother or sister who's caught in sin. This is the idea of church discipline. We just talked about this in our Friendship 101 class this morning. The fact that we are to restore, yield to the Spirit in restoring. It doesn't say condemn. If someone's caught in sin, it doesn't say go and condemn them so they get it right and get on the right path. No, it says go in a spirit of gentleness and restore one another we love you too much to to just ignore what is happening and how satan's getting a grab on your heart how can we do that to one another church may we look and say lord help me as i try try to yield to you in in this conversation because it's going to be hard it's awkward to talk about sin with one another but i love them that much i I just have to talk to them about it Verse 2 shows that we're to bear one another's burdens. And, and I believe that is so true. Not, not a spiritual burden, a physical burden, a sin struggle, whatever it is. This idea of bearing one another's struggles. We must do that as a family. It bonds us together as a family. When you share a burden with someone, you become united as a brother or a sister so closely at times. Share with them. In fact, your burdens don't belong to you. They belong to the church. You all realize that? Your burdens belong to the church. Don't carry them on your own. You say, what about verse 5? I'll get there. 
Verse 4 shows us the importance of, of not comparing ourselves with others. Um, this idea of not thinking too highly of yourself, not competing with one another because it festers up this pride in a sense. And the rejoicing that he's talking about there when he talks about rejoicing and, or, or, or boasting or priding in yourself, the, the, I really believe the understanding of this is, is that we rejoice in what Christ is doing. That's been the message from the very beginning. As you examine yourself, stop comparing yourself to one another. And look at yourself before the lens of Christ and His holiness. And then do rejoice in what God's doing in your life. Rejoice in that, absolutely. And then verse 5 reminds us that we have our own personal responsibility. And I believe he's talking about judgment here. As we stand before the Lord, we will not stand corporately before the Lord. We'll stand individually before the Lord. And so while our faith is very corporate, it has got an individual aspect. As we, It's our heart that must be changed and transformed. It's us standing before God giving an account like we talked about two weeks ago. And so we, it, it's two different words. Verse 2 and verse 5, one they use as, as burden and one they use as load or struggles or load. Those are two different words. He's not talking about the same thing here. Verse 6 shows us that how you're to treat the one who preaches the word of God. That's what it's really getting at here. <clears throat> it talks about how to share in the good things uh, with the one that, that teaches you the word of God and you as you learn. And so he's really getting at this idea of, of how you do that. But more so than that, too, there's an idea of, of him kind of exalting the importance of the Word of God, teaching of the Word of God. And I just want to take a moment this morning, church. First off, if you're listening, say, I'm listening. I want to thank you all for the way that you all share in all good things with me and my wife. I really just want to take the opportunity because Christ has called us in His Word through Galatians. Paul's saying it right here. And I just really appreciate, um, y'all will never know how blessed um, we are because of the way y'all share in all good things and the way you provide and support me and my wife um, to the point where she was able to quit her job and join the ministry with me. I mean, praise God. I, I can't tell you how much of a blessing that is. And I just want to thank y'all for that. In fact, um, it's because of that, the way you provide in that way that I have the opportunity to get into God's word and, and literally spend hours preparing to, to bring a message before you that I'm held accountable for. But it's because of your faithfulness and your giving and all that that, that helps in that, absolutely. It's, it's because of that that I was able to spend, and I'm not kidding, church, uh, 15 to 20 to sometimes 25 plus hours preparing for a message. You say, that's crazy. My undergraduate told me an hour for every minute you're in the pulpit. <laughs> I'm not there. But many weeks go where it's 15, 20, 25 plus hours and the reason that I'm able to do that is because of y'all. And I appreciate y'all giving me the opportunity to do that. And what am I doing in that time? You say, that's a long time. Maybe you'll understand it this way. Sometimes it takes more time to prepare not to say something than it does to prepare to say something. Y'all ever realize that? <laughs> Amen? It takes more effort and more time to not say something than it does to just say something sometimes. And that's what my preparation is to help you understand the way I see it. Is, as I spend that 15, 20, 25 hours, I'm spending that entire time on my face meeting with a God that loves every one of us and has a message for us. And I'm saying, Lord, help me not say anything this Sunday. Help you say whatever you desire to say, but help me say nothing. That's what that time is, and I just want to thank you all for giving me the opportunity to do that. I'm also thankful for the way you desire the Word of God. Church, um, <laughs> there's a lot of churches that claim to be churches, claim to, to preach, and unfortunately, I just don't see um, uh, it in, in some churches. Some churches I see, they get behind the pulpit, and they have a political agenda that they're getting at, or they have... Um, um, a, a, a self-help message in which you just kind of sprinkle Bible verses on a message or, or it turns into kind of a comical thing or an, an entertainment thing. And, and church, I, I'm just so thankful that that's not your desire. Your desire is the Word of God. As we come together, it's not about self-help. It's not about a comedy. It's not about entertaining. We're going to open up the Word of God and say, God, speak. And what a blessing that is. Not all churches are like that. I'm not saying in a sense of, of pride in ourselves. I'm saying in a sense of humbling ourselves because the Spirit of God has given us that. 
he goes on with reaping what you sow. The last thing here, the verse 9, though, before I finish it, it says, Now do not grow weary in doing good, for in due season we'll reap if we do, don't lose heart. I want to talk about that for a minute. We will reap in due season if we do not lose heart. Continue to do good. I just want to mention something real quick. This virus stuff, this coronavirus, if I can just be honest with you, I'm struggling. I think y'all are probably struggling a little bit too with it. It's just driving me crazy. Amen? I mean, it's all we talk about. It's all that's on the news. It's all that, 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 that we struggle with. And, and I don't say that we, it shouldn't be. It's a huge deal. I get it. But here's the thing I'm struggling with is I can't, I go every day. I'm, I'm telling you, every day it crosses my mind of how the coronavirus affects us as a faith family. That's a burden. And I need, I'm asking for help to, to, to carry that with me because that's a struggle. It's hard because I, I believe, although it's, I know it's real and I know there's struggles in it, and I, and I want to protect the sheep just as a shepherd would. And I, I try to do that. And I hope you've seen that, that we're trying to do that. And I, I fell at that, yes. But I, I want you to see something. That I do believe that Satan is going to use whatever it is to take our attention off of Christ and the gospel. Church, I'm begging you to not throw away gospel, Christ, and unity because of any distraction, whether it's a merited distraction or not. It's not merited enough to take our eyes off of Jesus. Amen? Because I believe in due season, in due time, we will reap if we do not lose heart. Let us not lose heart, church. Amen? Pray for those that are struggling through it. Pray for those that face it daily at the medical field and, and, and us that are, that are older and have complications and spouses and parents. It's a struggle, I know. Please don't misunderstand me. I do believe it is a distraction. I don't think that means we shouldn't talk about it and shouldn't be focused on it. Just don't let it take our focus from Christ. The last thing I want us to see here, we walk, live as one who boasts only in the cross. I'm just going to read this. Verse 11 of chapter 6. Say amen if you're there. We boast only in the cross. Verse 11. See what large letters I have written to you with my own hand. Paul's finishing this up here. And you see, Paul dictated. It's thought that Paul dictated most of his letters. He would talk in someone else like Timothy or Titus or whoever was there. He would write it for him. And so oftentimes uh, it was dictated. And so this is interesting because Paul literally says, Hey, just stop there. Give me that pen. <laughs> He takes the pen from whoever it is, one of the brothers, and he starts writing. He doesn't use regular letters. He says, I am writing with large letters, so you know this is my hand. Verse 11, see what with large letters I have written to you with my own hand. As many as desire to make a good showing in the flesh, try to puff themselves up, these would compel you to be circumcised, only that they may not suffer persecution of the cross of Christ. For not even those who are circumcised keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. Paul's saying this is so ironic. He's saying these people desire not to suffer the persecution of the cross. To the fact that they, they boast up themselves. In verse 14 he says, but listen, but God forbid that I should boast of anything except in the cross of Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. Paul says, I boast only in the Lord, not myself, not anything else. I boast in the Lord and I boast in his cross. Now, this is, is kind of funny in a way, um, not funny, comical, but but strange. Can you imagine this in their ears? This isn't elegant words. I mean, we've, we've uh, made the cross something we wear as a necklace and a symbol. And, and praise the Lord, uh, we boast in that. But at first, before that understanding came, imagine what Paul's saying here. I boast in the cross of the Lord. I read a commentary this week, and it was talking about um, um, comparing it to the, the, the electric chair. He says there's an element of torture. He said that'd be like wearing little necklaces that have electric chairs on them and and. and putting uh, pictures in our houses of electric chairs. He says, that's how bizarre this thought is when you really think about what he's boasting in here. Now, of course, we connect that to Christ and we relate and identify in Christ. But to the first ear, the first century ear, this is bizarre. He says, I boast in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he continues, he says in verse 16, and as many of you, well, before I even get there, 
Yeah, as many of you walk according to this rule, what rule? This rule of Christ, the Spirit. He says, peace and mercy be upon you and upon the Israel of God. Follow now, or uh, verse 17, from now on, let no one trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says, not only do I boast with my mouth in the cross, he says, I have been crucified with Christ. And in fact, I bear the marks of that. What is he talking about here? He's writing to the Galatians church. We just went through this in, in Acts. You remember when he was there in Lystra, what happened to him? He was stoned, presumed to be dead. Paul saying, I not only boast with my mouth, but, but I have scars because of the persecution of the cross. He says, I identify with that. It, it's, it's, the world's been crucified to me. He says, I boast in Christ. My praise is in Christ. My identity is in Christ. The death, the burial, the resurrection. My hope is in Christ. My desire is in Christ. My love, my joy, my peace, my long suffering, my gentleness, faithfulness, goodness. It's all in Christ. My life is in Christ. And he says, brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you, with your spirit. Amen. What a letter. What a letter, church. As we wrap this up this morning, we've went through all of Galatians. What a letter. What a message from God. And it ends with this bold, literally Paul's bold handwriting. <laughs> And he's saying, walk in the Spirit. Church, as we respond this morning, I want you to ask yourself one question. Am I walking in the flesh or am I walking in the Spirit? In the flesh or in the Spirit? And I want to clear something up. I think sometimes this invitation can be so awkward and confusing sometimes. Sometimes we think that... Um, we get in our head and we say, well, if I'm walking in the flesh, that means I'm not saved. But I think I'm saved. And we, we get in this thought of, am I really saved or am I not? And I want to just address that for a second this morning. Am I really saved or am I not? As you deal with that, because that's a healthy question. But as you deal with that question, I want you to focus on the correct source. Because if you sit there and say, I, I, I'm walking in the flesh, it's clear as day. I can't hide from it. But I know I, I prayed and I asked Jesus to come in my heart and I know I'm saved. And I know that he walked with me during that time. And so I'm struggling. I don't know what this means. I want to encourage you to, to, to not focus on a time in which you accepted Jesus Christ or not. And that might sound bizarre of a preacher's mouth, but I don't want you to, to come back to this time. That's not the source. You doing this certain thing is not the source. The source is Christ. And my prayer is I don't care when that has happened or hasn't happened or that you're unsure about. My question is, is today, this morning, right now, are you in Christ and he in you? Are you walking in the Spirit? Don't worry about what that means outside of today. Focus on right now. Are you in Christ? And maybe you just say today, Lord, I want to respond, and I'm still a little confused. But here's what I know. I want to walk in your Spirit, and I want you to be so alive in me that it shows in every aspect of my life. Isn't that a valid prayer to pray today? No matter what you've done or haven't done in the past, May we pray that today. Father God, Lord, I just pray for discernment and clarity and wisdom, Lord. Not by our minds, but by your spirit, Lord. God, um, I desire that we know you, Lord. And Lord, you desire that we know you. You've given us all of your word to know you. And God, uh, as you come to this question, Lord, um, is really asked to the believers, Lord. He calls them brethren. Paul says, brethren, those that are in Christ. He says, don't walk in the flesh, walk in the spirit. Lord, that's my encouragement, exhortation, Lord, today to us, Lord. As a pastor, I pray, Lord, that you would help us not walk in the flesh, but in the spirit, Lord. And Lord, not for our glory, but yours alone, God. Lord, I pray that we would be the most uh, uh, love-filled people, the most joy-filled people, the most peace-filled people, gentle, loving, kind, Lord, faithful people, self-controlled people, Lord. Help us be that, not because of, of the things that we desire, but because we look like you, Jesus. Live in us, Lord. Live in us, Lord. Lord, this is possible by your grace. And we respond by faith, Lord. 
Help us respond this morning, Lord, by placing our faith, our trust in you alone. You are worthy of it, Lord. Let us turn to you, Christ. In the name of Christ, I pray. Amen. If y'all would just take the time, just stay seated and just take a couple minutes here and, and just, just seek the Lord by yourself. Just seek the Lord. Maybe even pray with someone if you want, but seek the Lord in this time. If y'all want to come talk with me. Clayton, you keep pray, playing. I want to ask right now if there's someone that's just feeling burdened. Part of this passage that we just read that would be that we share burdens with one another, that we carry one another's burdens. And so I want you all, if you're burdened, you don't have to share what your burden is, but I want you to stand up. Just stand up right where you are. If you're feeling a burden that you need the church to carry with you, would you stand up right now? And, and what, what I want to happen right now is I want us to literally take and reach our hand out. Don't touch them right now. Just reach out toward them. And just pray over them. If you see someone standing next to you, pray over them right now. Miss Sue standing, would you reach up? Pray over her right now. Would you ask the Lord to help her and carry that burden? Anyone else that feels like they have a burden that they need the church to help them carry, would you stand? Would you help Miss Doris carry this burden? your burden church it's the church's burden don't carry it on your own heavenly father lord i cry out to the name of jesus this morning lord thanking you for a household of faith lord a family, brothers and sisters in Christ, in which we can walk through the scripture together, hear your voice, Lord, and lean on you and yield to the Spirit, God. What a blessing that is to do that together, Lord. Lord, this is my family, and I praise you for them and thank you for them, Lord. Lord, I lift up Miss Sue, Lord, to you. Sue Tuttle, Lord, I, what she's got going on, Lord, I pray that you help us as a church wrap around her, Lord, and, and take her to the throne of grace, God. Lord, that this burden would be not on her shoulders alone or on her and her husband's, Lord, but it would be on the entire church, God, Lord, that we would have a burden, Lord, in a, an awesome way, Lord, to come before the cross, to lay it down at your feet. Lord, for Miss Doris, I lift her up to you right now, God. Lord, what she's got going on, Lord, you know her heart, you know the struggle, Lord, I pray as a church we can wrap around our sister. Lord, we lift her to you high, Lord. And ask for your help, Lord, your patience, your discernment, Lord, your wisdom, your peace and comfort, Lord. God, anyone else in here that's not standing, God, but know they have a burden, God, I pray that you would help us to, to, to reach out and see when each other are struggling and, and lift each other up, that we'd pray over them, Lord, that we would be vulnerable to one another, Lord, and share when we're struggling, God. Lord, we just praise you this morning, God, and thank you for a day in your house. As we leave this place, Lord, I ask that you would help us be the church and live and walk in the spirit in the name of christ i pray amen